uh, TDD practitioners starting with Ron Jeffries, Ken Beck, some of these guys uh, all the way to uh, you know practitioners who are doing this on a day to day job and kind of understanding what are the different styles or avatars of doing test driven development and this is a workshop so I am going to give you just a quick introduction and then you guys are going to be actually uh, taking different problems and seeing how you would apply test driven development, how, what is the first test you would write, what is the thought process that goes through and that is that's what we are going to try and do in this workshop. While building products there are two very important questions that one needs to understand, one is are we building the product right, right, are we building the product right which is more of a business facing question. And the second one is are we building the right product, sorry the other way around, are we building the right product which is more of a business facing question and are we building the product right which is more of an implementation slash technology facing question, right. Why is this important? Because without understanding these two questions, right, the chances are that you might be focusing on the wrong things when doing test driven development, right. So this is, this is a very two important questions. Brian Marek who is one of the leading agile testing guru and also the author, one of the authors of the agile manifesto basically came up with this categorization of tests to help people understand which test fits into which quadrant and what is the purpose of the test. So he says on the top we have business facing and on the top, uh, bottom we have technology slash implementation facing, on the left we have, that is your left, we have supports programming, these set of tests help programming helps the developers, helps the team drive the development and the tests on the right critique the product. These are the kind of tests which after the fact once, once a little piece of code is written after that the fact it validates whether it is actually doing what you want it to do, right. So if you take any of these four quadrants uh, you should be able to uh, take any test and put it in one of these four quadrants and understand why it fits there and what is its purpose. So let us see. Uh, what test should fit into the bottom left corner, drives development but is technology slash implementation facing, unit tests right, unit tests would fit into that quadrant, what are the kind of tests that would fit into the quadrant above that which is business facing and drives development, these are the kind of things that will help you drive your development, these are the kind of things that will tell you what needs to be done and whether you are doing it, whether you are building the right product. Acceptance tests, right, acceptance tests help you do that, any other kinds of tests? There is no such thing called functional tests. Integration tests, is it business facing or technology facing? right. So integration test should go down there, right. You do not write integration test from an end user's point of view, you write integration test from an implementer's point of view. So unit test, integration test, I put all of them into the same bucket over there. There is one other kinds of test which is known as low fidelity prototypes. What are low fidelity prototypes? Low fidelity prototypes are essentially things that you do on paper prototypes or some simple mocks that you do. If people were here for the yesterday's session I ran, we actually built a low fidelity prototype here, we drew a coffee vending machine on the board and we said how the user will interact and then we actually went through and did some tests, right, is this the right kind of an interaction, you know. So you even before you start building this helps you validate certain things from what the end user's interaction would look like, all right. So we have low fidelity prototypes, we have acceptance tests in that quadrant. What are the kind of tests that fits on the quadrant next to it? Business facing critiques, those are kind of tests you do after the fact you have written the code. It does not have to be at the end of your project, right, that will be too late. As soon as something is ready, what kind of tests will go there? Acceptance test is already there, right. Load test is it end user business facing or technology implementation facing? Performance might be from SLA's point of view, but really it is an implementation thing, right? Boundary testing, boundary testing, all of these tests cover boundary testing, right? It is not a separate thing in itself. 
usability testing who's the gentleman who said usability testing that that's right we've done some usability testing using our low fidelity prototypes but not the whole thing right so we need more usability testing what else i'll give you a hint it's manual it's not something that can be automated exploratory testing right everyone's familiar with exploratory testing so you would have exploratory testing in that quadrant ui usability testing and exploratory testing those are the things that you would fit into that quadrant some people say that we actually do acceptance tests which are driven from the ui right i have not had very good success with that so i still would put the ui test in that quadrant and those are really very little in in a large project for me so it's it's okay to do them after the fact if provided they are like maybe 20 or 25 at max on a project with 60000 tests uh what kind of test would fit into that last quadrant performance test system test integration tests are more drives development not after the fact right so we would have performance test system test other kinds of things so this is kind of you know and you can take any other kinds of test and fit into one of those four quadrants why is this useful it's useful because i want to explain where test driven development actually fits right well, can i use test driven development to do uh, system tests i can but you know just because i can i should not right where would i use test driven development then things that drives development right that's the, you had the clue right on the screen it says drives development the test that drives development that's the quadrant where you would use test driven development so in the paper that i wrote i was talking earlier titled avatars of test driven development we talk about two broad categories of test driven development approaches one is the outside in approach of doing test driven development what is an outside in way of doing test driven development starting from a business facing question driving your test down to the implementation right that's an outside in test uh for those who who were here yesterday we did an outside in way of doing test driven development we started from how a user would interact with the coffee vending machine and we drove the implementation from there right so that's an outside in way of doing test driven development what's an inside out way of doing test driven development where you start with one core entity right so i was pairing with ron jeffries for those who don't know ron jeffries is one of the three people who came up with extreme programming right so i was pairing with ron jeffries and ron jeffries when we were pairing on a particular problem i'll talk about that in a minute he started writing as he read through the problem definition he started writing on his index cards and he kind of kept moving them around and then after looking at all of them he said the central the entity the the thing that holds all of this thing together is a clinic and he kind of wrote on the index card clinic and he said this is where i'm going to start so he started with clinic tests right so you start with something which is very crux and you build the system out right so that's an inside out way of doing test driven development and we're going to get you to experience all these different types of test driven development in this workshop before that i want to just step back and make sure we're all on the same page what we mean by test driven development i hope everyone's familiar with this but i want to do a quick recap so we start with the tests we start with an automated tests right what happens when you run this test you're lucky it doesn't even compile for me Right? when i write the first test it doesn't even compile if i'm using dynamic language then it's a runtime error but it doesn't fail it just blows up right so to get this to work i need to frame the test i need to make sure i have just enough code in place to to make that work right to make it compile or to not to throw up any runtime stuff so let's say i'm able to do that and then i run the test now what do you expect to happen you expect it to fail but what if it passes be suspicious if it if it passes be suspicious maybe something's wrong maybe the test you wrote is not right 
However, right, let us not be dogmatic because I have had arguments with people who will say, oh, uh, your test expected a 0, now you should put in your code minus 1 so that the test can fail. I am like, what? Life is too short for that nonsense, right? If I expect 0 and my code happens to give 0, yes, that is fine. But let me be suspicious. Let me now write another test that will not expect 0, right? But that does happen sometimes when you write a test and you, you expect it to fail, uh, it might pass, you need to be suspicious, right? But you expect it to fail. When it fails, what do you want to do? Let us take a month and do some design, right? No? Make some little change to the code, write some code, change some existing code, make a little change. The little change is to make that test pass, right? The, the, our idea is to get the test to pass as quickly as possible by not damaging the existing system, by not going in and hacking stuff over there, right? We want to do as little elegant code as we can to make it work, right? And then you run the test. What should happen? If it fails, Make a little more change. Resync your mental model with what's happening on in, in your computer, right? Because those two models have gone out of sync. You expect it to pass, it didn't, slow down, think what went wrong, fix that. Ideally you expect it to pass. Then what do you do? Call success and go home for a beer? Add more tests. A lot of people do this two step cycle. Write code, write test, write code, write test, write code, right? After three months, six months, they come back saying, I can't deal with this shit. Who wrote this? This is not maintainable anymore, right? The design sucks. There's a whole lot of duplication. It's not clear what's going on, right? Because we are in a phase where we do reflexive design, and to do reflexive design, we need what we refer to as refactoring, right? We want to look at what our design is, not just the test not just the production code but also the test code to eliminate any kind of duplication to eliminate any kind of redundancy make sure that it's communicative make sure we've addressed all the code smells there are about 33 different code smells so we want to ensure all of that done all of those things are done right one great way to do that is to do pair programming and have a pair look at it and say hey does this make sense right if both of you agree chances are most other people will agree we always refactor when we have passing tests right and then we repeat this cycle until we have satisfied the four rules of simplicity. Anyone who knows the four rules of simplicity? When do you stop test-driven development on a particular problem, on a particular story? There are four rules of simplicity that we need to satisfy when we can say, yes, I think I'm done. First rule, simple, all tests should pass. Not just the test you wrote, but all the tests that existed before that should pass. Can you call it done before that? No. What's the second rule? 100% coverage. That's for the managers to keep them happy. It meets all the requirements, but that's what your test is right for. If your tests are not passing, you've not met all the requirements. So that's already covered in point one. Point two is the code communicates. It's not, it should not look like a cat came and walked over your keyboard. It has to make some logical sense for someone who's going to come back and look at it. So it has to communicate. What's the third thing? Third thing, come on. What else would you look at? No duplication, right? So the code communicates, but there could be bunch of duplication, right? So let's generalize it a little bit and say there is no code smells. We've addressed all the code smells. So duplication might be one. There are many other code smells like primitive obsession, like uh, speculative generality. So there's a whole uh, catalog of about 33 code smells. So we want to ensure that none of the code smells exist. So that's the third rule. Right? What's the last one? That's what my tests are for, for documentation. 
The fourth one is minimalism, right? You want it to be as minimalistic as possible, as little code as possible, without compromising on communication and quality of the design, right? So those are four rules of simplicity. That's when you will say, I can stop this cycle. I want to move on to something else, right? I know you guys expected this to be a workshop and I'm kind of just boring you guys with some gyan which you don't want. So I'm going to move along quickly. Everyone's familiar with this cycle, acceptance test driven development cycle. I'm just going to boom, 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 run through it. Slow, slow, slow. Fast, fast, fast. How about that? We went two back. So we have user stories. User stories have a set of acceptance criteria, right? That's what we use in the planning meeting to decide how much scope we can actually consume, how many stories we can actually consume in the next sprint. Once we agree on that, then we start the iteration. Once we start the iteration, the developer would call the subject matter expert and probably the tester, if you have a, someone who specializes in testing. Three of you are going to sit down. It doesn't have to be three people. It could be one person playing all the three roles, right? So those are three different perspectives that you want to have. And you sit down and you write what we call as the automated acceptance test, right? We want to capture what are the different scenarios or examples for the criteria that we just laid down during the planning meeting. At some point, the developer will say, okay, you've written two or three scenarios. I know where this is going. I can see, I can guess what the next one will be. And at this point, I feel comfortable to go ahead and start hacking some code. Right? So the developer would go off and start using automated unit test driven development to drive the development while the tester might cover other scenarios, other edge cases, other things which are important. While the subject matter expert, the business analyst, whoever it is, might go and help other people do this or look at the next print, what are the stories that are coming, do they have good acceptance criteria or not. So everyone kind of then goes back and starts doing stuff. When all the tests, all the unit tests are passing, can the developer say, I'm done? Of course not, because you also have to make sure all the acceptance tests are passing, right? When, unless all the acceptance tests are passing, you cannot say, just because I've written a bunch of unit tests, my, my job is done. That's not accepted, right? So you want to make sure all your acceptance tests are passing, not just the two that you started with, but in the meantime, the tester might have written 10 other acceptance tests. You want to make sure all acceptance tests are passing. Let's say all, all of those tests are passing, right? Can I say I'm done as a developer? Not yet. What is the one thing that we are still missing? Rule of simplicity. That, that's already taken care. When we are saying that unit test driven development you have done, you have applied all the rule of simplicity and you have made sure all the requirements are fulfilled. But one thing that's still missing is the exploratory testing. Right? You want to do some exploratory testing to make sure that there is nothing that you have missed out from a point of view of uh, you know, something that the system will allow you to now do because this feature is added, which might be a security issue, which might be something that will confuse your users, whatever it is, something that you had not anticipated. So when all of this is done, maybe you will discover during exploratory testing something that you did not think about in the beginning. You would go back, capture that as an automated acceptance test and complete the cycle again, right? And then, of course, you do your sprint demos where you get the acceptance on the criteria and then uh, maybe a sprint or two later when you have a stable UI, when you have built an end-to-end UI, maybe a, a screen together, you might actually write some automated acceptance tests, uh, sorry, UI tests and also do some performance tests when you have something critical, you know, available with you. Right? So that's in a nutshell what the acceptance test driven development cycle is. So right now, I've actually introduced to you two different uh, levels of test driven development, right? But I want to introduce you to the whole gamut of test driven development, all the different avatars of doing test driven development, which is what this workshop is. But before that, a small commercial break, right? People have already seen this, so I'm going to just blaze through this. That's me uh, in Colorado uh, with Venkat Subramaniam. We were hiking here, a lot of fun. Uh, I live in Mumbai. Uh, these are communities or conferences that I've organized. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur. I have two startup companies. Uh, I'm not going to go into details of that. Bunch of companies that I've worked for either as an employee or as a consultant. Uh, 
Now I'll come back to the topic, right? Uh, how many people here have been to Uppsala conference? Okay, that's sad. This is, you're really missing something in your life. Uh, Uppsala conference is where really all the patterns, all the good stuff that we hear about have come out of, right? So, you know, it's like some people have, you know, I should go to Kailash Parvat before I die. So put one saying, I need to go to an Uppsala conference before I die. This is extremely important to go meet the, you know, really awesome guys over there. I happened to fulfill my Teeth Yatra once. So I was at uh, Uppsala conference in 2006, I believe it was. Uh, and I participated in what they call as the design fest. So the gang of four guys run something called as the design fest. So you form groups. You basically subscribe to the, you know, you say I want to participate in the design fest. Then they randomly assign groups. They form groups. They give you a problem. And then through the day, you have to work in a group and you have to come up with the best design for the problem, right? So I happened to be part of one group where people were, you know, this was the first 15 minutes of the discussion. They read through the problem and they say, oh, that's a noun, so that should be a class. Oh, that's a verb, so that should be a method, right? And then we hit across this position where we were saying, well, the, you know, this is a veterinarian information system problem that we were. So, you know, you take your patient, uh, you take your pets to the uh, vet and you get some vaccinations done and things like that. So we were talking about that particular use case. And uh, so actually, let me show you. It's, it's really small, but that's kind of the problem that was given to us. There are a whole bunch of use cases. But if you see here, the first use case that we have here, where, you know, Dave Atkins takes his pet, uh, Doberman, uh, Fluffy, uh, to the vet and gets vaccinations done and regular checkup done. And we were talking about this and one person was saying, well, we have a, a, a patient, which is, which is the pet, and we have a doctor, right? Now, who, who should have the method give shot or take shot, right? The rabies vaccination, you're giving a shot. Should it be on the patient? Can the patient take a shot, right? So should the method be on the patient? Should the method be on the doctor saying give shot, right? And this argument went on for about an hour, right? Because it's a, it's a very important discussion. And at that point, I felt life is too short to waste time. So I actually left the group and I said, you know what? I'm just going to try doing test-driven development on this. So by the time these... Uh, great guys come up with their fantastic design, probably I'll actually have a working software uh, to demonstrate what, what this wet information system. So I went off and I started working on my own. There were people at the conference who knew me who were passing by. They said, what are you doing? I said, I'm trying to do test-driven development on this. They would say, hey, can I pair with you? I'm like, that's awesome. Let's sit down. And I started pairing with them and something hit me. You know, this is 2006. I've been doing test-driven development now for about five years at that point. And suddenly something hit me. I'm like, oh, that's that's very different way of doing test-driven development than I'm kind of doing here, right? So I'm like, you know what? This is very interesting. There are actually very different ways or very different styles of doing test-driven development. And I always thought that this is the right way and this is the only way because, you know, if you look at the slide I showed you, it's so simple, right? Write a test, make it work, refactor, go back. What, what variations can you have in that? Right? This so, that's such a so simple thing. But when I started pairing with people, it hit me and I then took on this role of a journeyman to go and pair with different people and learn from them what are the different styles of doing test driven development. I'm going to show you quickly a few glimpses of what we covered and then I'm going to let you guys do some exercise where you will also discover some of the different styles of doing test driven development. Uh, so this is uh, acceptance test written in fitness for that first use case that you saw. And this is the kind of design we ended up with. This is in retrospect. We just did a, we, did, we pulled up from the code what we came up with in terms of a design. A procedure, a bill, an account, a receipt, all of these are classes, no interfaces. This is an uh, acceptance test wrote, uh, written in Ruby. Uh, and what we ended up with is this kind of a design, right? Slightly different. This is uh, what I was talking that when I worked with uh, Ron Jeffries, for example, this is, this is what we wrote. And this is the kind of design we ended up with. Now you can see exact same problem, exact same time. 
you know, spent by people and quite different designs, not drastically different, but quite different designs, right. Uh, this is another, this used to be my style of doing test driven development where I didn't have, you know, I didn't say clinic test. I would, I would, my test would all be, if you see here, let me highlight that. If you see here, it says uh, charge account for service. That's my test. I don't really know what classes I need yet, right? I've not done the design. I'm going to let my test flush out the design, but I know this is the behavior I expect, which is charge account for service and I would end up writing all my code in the in the test until actually I figured out hey these set of methods actually belong on an object which should be you know visit or should be clinic or whatever and that's how you know the design would evolve and that's kind of the design that I would end up with fairly complicated in some sense with all the cross sections going between those classes and interfaces but also arguably fairly decoupled right. My point about showing these is not that one style of doing test driven development is better than other the style, but just the fact that there are different styles of doing test driven development and each leading to a different design, right. So I want you to experience this in this workshop. So you walk away with acknowledging that there are different styles of doing test driven development and how they influence your design. Something to keep in mind, this is kind of a quick summary that, <coughs> sorry, this is something that. Uh, <coughs> I need some water, that's too much text on the slide. <coughs> Sorry. So yeah, this kind of uh, is something me and William Wake came up with. Uh, anyone's familiar with the name William Wake? He's the guy who came up with the invest principle for user stories. Uh, He's also written a lot of uh, books on refactoring and stuff like that, really awesome guy. Uh, William Wake and I were sitting down and we came up with this grid saying, what are the kind of driving factors that drive you in different, uh, you know, drive different decisions when you're doing test driven development. So what I mean by that is, are you using your unit test predominantly to drive your test? Are you using your acceptance test to drive your test? What's your starting point, right? Are you going after the API or are you going from the UI? Are you looking at the API or are you looking at the interaction, right? Is it more stateful or is it more interaction centric? Is it more object oriented or more procedural in terms of the nature of job that you're performing? Do you go after the easy stuff or do you go after the core stuff, right? Do you start with something easy or do you start with something really core? Do you go narrow, very specific to one particular thing or do you go broad, right? Do you, do you use your test to drive the design, which means I have no idea what the design is going to be. I'm completely going to let it un unfold itself or I'm going to, I have a design in my mind and I will use the test to validate my design, right? So these are kind of some of the attributes or some of the uh, things that we went, which will influence your design uh, when you're doing test driven development. And this is kind of the X marks over there indicate a particular avatar of doing test driven development. You add X marks in a different place, it will lead to a different avatar of doing test driven development or a different style of doing test driven development, right? So right there, don't let your brain run and do a permutation on the number of boxes and say there are like 600 different ways of doing test driven development, that's not the point. All right, so enough of me talking, that's just the context I've set, which took about 30 minutes. So we have another one hour uh, for us to actually do four exercises and we're going to spend about 10 minutes on each exercise and then do a quick round of summary. Uh, so what we want to do is like for example, I have a simple bonus calculator example. Uh, I want you to form groups and each group is going to try and say what is the first test they're going to write for this particular problem, right? So let me explain this problem a little bit. It's a fairly simple problem. Uh, I have you know, I'm trying to calculate bonuses for my salespeople, right? So they have a certain amount of sales that they make in a year and they have a quota that they have to, you know, once they go over the quota, then they get the commission. But the commission is decided by a percentage of commission and tax is applicable on that percentage, right? And so if a person made a sale of 1,200, quota was 1,100, 10% tax, 10% uh, sorry, 10% commission, 10% tax, they would get 9 units, right? So that's the basic logic. 
if you didn't make enough sales, then your uh, if you if you didn't make enough sales, then your uh, bonus would essentially be zero, right? Very simple problem. Uh, it's probably only three lines of code to build this. Uh, but what's interesting is how, what is the first test you would write? How would you crack this problem right, if you're doing test-driven development? So form little groups and then uh, come up with how you would, what is the first test you would write and why you would start there. I'm going to time it for five minutes and then we're going to share, each group is going to share what they come up with. Right? This is a workshop, this is not a movie, so you've got to come up and start working. Compute, what, so what would be your first test? Whether it's eligible for bonus or not. Eligibility for bonus would be your first test. Outside in approach. Outside in approach, eligibility for test, okay? Uh, eligibility for bonus. So that Same thing, all right? Same, okay? Uh, I'm not interested in minute details. If it's same, let's move on. Calculating? Okay, let's go there. When sales is equal to quota, what do you expect? No bonus. So, no bonus for average performing use, uh, Salesperson, okay? It's about the same. Uh, eligibility for the board. eligibility group over there. Eligibility. Did not meet the quota and met the quota. Did not meet the quota and met the quota. Did not meet and did meet. Okay. That group, did you guys have any discussion? So I'm gonna yeah. Tell me the approach, don't tell me the details. Each row is a test. Okay? So here is the kind of test I would write. I'm doing this really fast because this is just a very simple one. I'm going to show you really complicated ones to, to go into. That's where the fun is. Can everyone read this, what's on the screen? No bonus for low performers. When sales is zero and quota is 100, then individual bonus is zero. No bonus for average performers. When sales is 100 and quota is 100, then individual bonus is zero. Right? Bonus based on commission percentage. Then we are saying bonus is based on, you don't want to see all those messages. Bonus is based on commission percentage after tax. And no bonus for that's, the, that's just the next version of uh, this. So we complicate the problem by adding more things later on and things like that. So that's pretty much how I would write test for this. And that's what style of test is that? Inside out or outside in? Inside out, outside in? Outside in. It's really inside out because I'm just dealing at a one particular salesperson level, right? I'm not building a whole sales management system. All right, let's move to a little more interesting problem, right? This problem is to do with calculating sales tax. And there are 
there are sales tax uh, at 10 percent but certain items are exempted from sales tax and then there is import duty which is charged at 5 percent if it is an imported product right. So given that is the basic thing uh, for now you can ignore the rounding and all of that stuff because we can get to it later and we have given some examples what is the first test you would write and why so again in your groups go through the same exercise I have shown you one example what I expect in terms of at the end of this exercise so I want you to think in those lines and tell me specifically how you would write the first test this one can be done both inside out and out, inside out and outside in so there is a lot of room for discussion. Don't spend the 10 minutes reading the problem. I already told you what the problem is. There are certain items which are exempted from 10 percent tax and there are certain items which get charged and import duty. That is it. There is nothing to read on the screen. That is easy. in which you would write the test would it be item test would it be sales tax test what is the name of the class exempted items test item test is exempted or is imported okay all right. Any any other solutions you guys came up with? Yeah, All right. You guys need to listen up because I can't hear if you're talking. Validate local exempted product. Validate local non-exempted product. Validate imported and exempted product. What's the tax on it? Validate which is imported and non-exempted product. There are four scenarios, and prior to one, validate product is local. And so what I want you to tell me is in what class you are going to write what test right. So what is the name of your test class and what is the name of your test alright that is what I expect. So come here alright calculate sales tax is the name of your test fixture. So you are validating that the import tax is 5 percent okay. That is the name of your test okay but what if the percentage changes you go back and change the test names right so something to watch out for we will go there. No, I'm done. Next group. Not done. Still designing. Okay, uh, I'll. Okay, you are not. Okay, I'll name the class as uh, sales tax, sales tax calculator test. Sorry. Sales tax. I don't want you to come up on the fly. You should have already done this. Yeah, I mean that's what I was thinking actually. And then uh, I will group the inputs, you know, to make one test, like you know, one book, one item, this, one test, and like that. Like why? So each line you will read and you will test that. Oh uh, yeah, I will take. I mean, um, make the hard coded inputs in each test, like one book, one other item, one next item, and this should be the output. So I'll supply the hard coded inputs in each test. And so again, okay, see what I'm asking. I just want to clarify. What am I asking from you guys? What is the name of the test fixture? Right? What is the name of your test class? What is the name of your test? That's all I need. Right? That's what I want you to tell me. So I'll give you another two minutes to come up with that, and then we'll go around. But the name of the class in which you will write the test and the test 
names. The method would so okay. we don't have mics. So we have only one class, uh, compute sales tax. Compute sales tax is the test. That the class, class is test. Now, I'm not interested in your production code at all. I don't care. I'm only interested in the test class name and the method, the test method names. That's all I care about. Tax test class. Tax test class, okay. In that we have four methods. Sales tax for uh, uh, sales tax for a domestic product without exemption. Uh, sales tax for a domestic product with exemption. Imp imported uh, uh, imported tax. Uh, and, uh, sales tax for imported products. Sales tax for imported. So four tests for all the four combinations. Four, four okay. On a sales tax. On the tax tax test. Tax calculator, tax calculator test. test. Tax. All right. We'll come here. Sales receipt generator. Mike, please. Yes, sales receipt generator, and we'll be uh, one. Sales receipt generator is the name of your test. Yeah. Okay. Generally, the convention is it either ends with test or starts with we'll test or something. We we'll end with test. Sales receipt generator test, and the first test method will be test sales receipt for non expo uh, for exported items, then for non imported. Same thing as that. For yeah. All right. Move next. I'm not trying to be rude to anyone. I just have a lot of content to cover, and I want to move as quickly as possible. So validate sales tax is our class. Validate sales tax is your class, all right? Uh, no tax on tax exempted item. That's one test. No tax on tax exempted item. Tax exempted item. Uh, tax on imported item. Tax on non exempted non exempted item. Okay. You need to pay a little more attention to someone reading those things should be able to understand it as documentation, right? These tests are your documentation, so the method names have to be more descriptive, something you want to pay attention to, right? All right, cool, thank you. Okay, so very similar to that, which is uh, validate uh, product price is the test class. Validate product price is the test class. So the methods are essentially this is one method which accepts, which is validate price, which accepts the product name and the build amount for it, which returns back whether the base product price plus the tax on it matches the price that was given to it from the billing system. So you would write one test, but how would you cover all the different scenarios? We don't have to cover, that's not externally exposed, right? In the database, you essentially would say, this is an imported product, that will be an entry in the database. That's not necessarily a, that's, a, that's an internal decision. It need not be something I else. understand it's an internal decision, but how would you make sure, right? When you're writing a test, you want to make sure that all the four different combinations are actually working, right? So, so the validate price would have, we have multiple, we have different products passed as arguments, the imported one, non-imported one, and then arbitrary price values passed to it to ensure that base price and import tax. So the challenge with that is, right, that that's referred to as an elephant test. The challenge with that is when that fails, you have no idea why it failed. It could fail because any one of those four conditions. So it doesn't give you pinpointed feedback, which is one of the important criteria for writing good acceptance test or unit test? Uh, item item tax test is our class. Then we have test for calculating tax for basic items, uh, exempted items, imported items, then come the combination of basic, exempted, imported, exempted. What are the names of your methods? You're still telling Calculate me tax for basic item is the first test. Calculate tax for exempted items. Calculate tax for imported items. Then calculate tax for basic exempted items. Okay, good. So those test names are more descriptive. Do they help you understand a little more better? Right? So that's good. We'll come here. Yeah. Our fiction name is sales tax calculator test. And uh, we have got the four uh, methods that everybody has been speaking about. Plus we have got one more method and that is uh, test product whether it's a local or imported. And test whether it's an imported or a local yeah. item. No, test product. That's just um, a method name that we are going to find out whether it's a local product or an imported product. And then we, we have two asserts inside that. Yeah. Uh, one assert per test rule. You've read that. That's you know you should have only one assert per per test because now if the first assert fails, your second thing will never get executed. Okay. Right. So you want to avoid that kind of an issue. Okay. And then we have test local. Exempted product tax, then you have test local non exempted product tax, 
test imported exempted tax, test imported non-exempted tax. So all the four combinations. Four combinations. Yes. Correct. Good. Go we'll go back there. You can give the mic. Uh, we would name the class as sales tax calculator test, and the method's name would be like uh, when uh, exempted uh, good uh, goods then uh, tax uh, should be 10 percent and when, uh, when exempted tax should be zero right zero yeah, yeah zero zero and when uh, the, the ca goods category uh, is non exempted then the tax should be a 10 percent so we'll name the methods in a similar way again i gave the feedback last time that if the percentages change because government wants to give you ask more and more tax right all the time so it's going to change when you go back and change your test names okay. so never put numbers in your test because that's something that's going to change and that will lead to higher maintenance of your tests right yeah we'll do that proof and then we'll come to you guys uh, question okay Different periods, that's not going to change. No. So you wouldn't add it in the test name. The, those, the, what you're trying to calculate over there is there's some thought process, some, uh, some formula you're trying to drive out which will essentially decide what percentage of interest should be applied. Right? So for a short duration loan, you know, taxes are, or interest is at a, uh, at a premium or a, or a long duration loan, the premiums, uh, the premiums on interest are low or things like that. That's what the test should, name should describe, not the percentages. All right. Well, uh, first case name will be test sales tax calculator and the uh, cases will be validate sales tax, validate import tax, validate sales and import tax and validate final price. So valid, four validate methods for all the four combinations. Okay. Come here, last group. Okay. In in the test name. In the test name. But uh, we are saying that the test uh, test name should be descriptive. So tomorrow, if the tax is increased or decreased or modified, so. Uh, when the test fails, I would actually come to know, okay, uh, it should be 10 percent, but why is it failing? Then I'll come to know either I need to modify the No, name. but you, when your assert fails, your assert will say expected 10 got 9, right? right. You get that feedback. That doesn't need to be in the name of your test. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, along, along with the four uh, uh, test cases, I would add a couple more like, you know, testing whether it's a valid product. So, testing whether uh, calculate tax works when you pass an invalid item. For example, how uh, do you pass an invalid item? Uh, maybe the Why do you design such that somebody can pass invalid item? So maybe they pass null for price or something. I mean, Should not be allowed at all, the, right? Depends on the, the structure of the item. Actually. Correct. So you are designing the structure of the item such that that should not be possible. Okay. Right? I wouldn't waste my life writing such tests because life is too short. You design such that someone cannot pass nulls, someone cannot pass random arbitrary stuff. If people can do that, that's a bad design in my opinion, right? So I'm going to show you, uh, I, I understand everyone has lots of questions, but I want to show you how I would write tests for this, right? So I have a shopping cart. So this is an outside in way of doing test driven development. I look at it from a shopping cart point of view. My system metaphor here is that I am in a store and I'm buying a whole bunch of items, putting it in my shopping cart and then I go to the checkout counter and I do a checkout and it tells me what is the amount, right? Think of this as shopping on Amazon, right? You, you, you keep adding items to your shopping cart, then you say shopping cart check out and it will give you, you know, what is the total amount, it will give you a receipt essentially and you will assert on the receipt various different things. So here we are saying check out empty cart, when I check out empty cart, my total should be zero, right, I, want, I went to the store, I didn't buy anything, my, my total should be zero. That's the easiest test I can write to get started with. Right, so that's my first test, but it's an outside in test from a user's perspective. Right, I'm writing this test. My second test is check out an exempted domestic item. 
right? When I check out an exempted domestic item, which is rupees hundred domestic book, right? My total should be hundred because I should have no tax on it. Fairly easy to write this test, right? Just return the price. Nothing more you need to do. Next test I would write is check out taxable domestic items. Domestic items that are taxable. So rupees hundred music CD should be hundred and ten and so on. So I would write a bunch of things and I would also say rounding logic because all this time I didn't worry about rounding stuff. So now I'm saying rounding logic needs to be tested, right? So that's driven based on the category and based on the price that you passed in and so forth. Uh, but that's not the only test I would write, right? That's only the starting point for me. There are a lot of other things that I would want to do inside this. So let's actually look at what other tests I would write. So I would have an item test. What does the item test contain? Certain categories are exempted from sales tax. What categories are exempted from sales tax? Most categories are taxable. Imported items have import duty. Imported non-exempted items have import duty and basic sales tax. Let's look at the receipt tests. I want to validate whether the receipt is being printed correctly. Right? So the re receipt tests is basically going to validate how I am printing the receipt. So each specific unit test at the individual classes level and the, the, the shopping cart test which is more of my acceptance test at the product level. Right? This is an outside in way of doing test driven development but how I would do this inside out. So it goes back to what metaphor you are using. right? So the metaphor I use here was I am Amazon, I'm building Amazon shopping cart and I'm adding stuff. I have no affiliation with Amazon by the way, there's no marketing I'm doing for them. I uh, just wanted to clarify that. If, if I'm adding stuff to Amazon shopping cart and then I do checkout and that should be the amount that I get on it, right? So that's an outside in way of doing the, a test. It's more from, can you think of an inside out way of implementing this system? Start with the tax calculation portion. I don't care about items, I don't care about anything. Given this is the amount, I need to apply this percentage tax, what should be the number on it, right? So I start with the calculation and then I say, oh, by the way, I have items, I have categories, I have other things and you kind of flush out your system and you say, oh, you can put things in the shopping cart, right? And you build the system out that way. That's the inside out way of doing test driven development. Clear? So this problem can be done in both styles. Yes. Two asserts is okay, but writing two asserts or two different things is not okay, right? So it's when we say one assert per test, it means that you should not validate two different things on a test. If to validate one thing, you have to literally write two assert statements. That's fine. Right? But if it's two different things that you're validating altogether, putting them inside one test is not a good idea. Break it apart into two different tests and call out what's the difference between the two. In that case, there's no difference between the two. Right? So that's what it means by one assert per test. It's not literally one assert statement per test. It says one assert per test, not one assert statement. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this was back when I was working uh, at a medical company and uh, they said what we want is we want to calculate the patient's age. We actually have a program that needs to be fed in uh, what is the age of the patient and based on the age we can give different medications, different dosages of medication. So there is another system which will essentially take the age and do some logic with it, right? So we have to, you know, they, they, they explained us very simply that this is the logic. If it's greater than one year, you just report things in, you know, number of years. If it is less than a year but greater than a month, then you report it in months. If it's less than a month, greater than a day, you report it in days. Less than a day, greater than an hour, report it in hours, right? Because here you could have a newborn who needs to be given certain dosage of a medication. So which is why you can, you need to know the age in these different durations. And your program has to be smart enough to figure out what is the closest match and report the age in the closest match, all right? So this is fairly simple. They added another twist into the story. They said, by the way, uh, you know, doctors and nurses can add new durations. 
these are duration standard durations that we know but I want to know bi-weekly right or I might add a new because a, a new pharma company came up with a new way of measuring you know based on lu lunar calendar they measure something and then every you know some lunar cycle fourth night or whatever you need to be given every every Ramzan night you need to be given one dosage of something so they can actually come up with different durations at different points in time and your program has to be smart enough to take that duration and then report in the closest matching list of durations all right so that's the problem what is the first test you're going to write all right I want to know the name of your test class and I want to know the name of the test that you're going to write. Identify the patient's name with age. Identify the patient's name. age, name. Name with age. Name and age. Yeah. Tomorrow they want to add something more. That we are defining. <laughs> we have identified only one. No, but I'm saying the name of your class should again not include what data you are can try to get. The data. No, I am not defining the number of uh, age number and all. I just have given the. Not number. You're saying name and age, right? Tomorrow you might need name, age and gender. You don't want to go change the test for that. Uh, we can have identify the patient's details. Identify patient's details. Okay, we'll come back to it. We'll look at some other class, some other guys. Use the mic please. Hello. Actually, uh, I came up with only one test. Uh, name of the just tell me the name of the test and the, the method. Patient's name should contain uh, duration <laughs> keyword. Patient's name should contain duration. Is that the method name or the class name? This is the method name. Method name. What class would it be? Um. Okay. Next, please. We are running short of time. So, we said patient age calculator is the test class name. Patient age calculator is the class name. Yeah, and then we have uh, check age in hours, check age in uh, what days, months. So, the only thing that we were not sure was how is the input. Technically, for us, we just need the date and time of birth, and then the program should be able to return back all of these, whether it is in, if it is the same day, then it returns in hours. If it is the same month, then it turns in days and blah, 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 blah. That's so the implementation detail, right? I don't right. really care so about what it. what I was not sure was uh, how, how is the patient's information going to be stored so that we can then... Uh, that's, that's what you would design. Right? Okay. That's what your test will help you design, right? Okay. All right. Oh, there? So with test-driven development, right, we are trying to drive the design as we are building. So we are going to decide how we want to store the patient's information. So we can do these calculations. Okay, the uh, test class name is patient registration test. Your friends are not interested in listening to you. So what should we do? No, I should ma make more sense. You need to make more noise? <laughs> Maybe. All right. Guys, if you're not interested in listening to anybody else, you're not going to learn anything, trust me. It's not a race, right? Nobody's going to get a prize here. So we want to see what other people have come to, so you'll actually learn from it, right? So please pay attention. So uh, we tried outside in, and uh, class name is patient registration test. Patient and registration uh, test, okay. And the uh, methods are, let's say, calculate age in hours. Calculate age in hours, calculate age in, in days. days. Okay. What if new durations come in? Weeks. What happens when you get weeks? New tests? New 
you write the test first and then add the code? Uh, I gave you a little bit of context, right? This is a medical system. This gets deployed in hospitals. You know how long it takes for you to make a change in the code and get it into the hospital? Yeah. It goes through FDA regulations, right? You see, you know, this is not going to allow you to hack some code on the server in the hospital, right? These patients are going to die if you screw up. So it goes through an FDA regulation. So something to keep in mind. This is why I'm choosing these problems because these problems put hard constraints and it kind of really forces you how you would design things. So if your test names are kind of hard coding, it's a good indication that this program is not extensible. Right? Again, your tests are telling you something about how you should be designing. All right? So that's why it's called test driven design. But good try. Uh, let's come to this group. Same thing? No, uh, I just have only one test case that I could think of right now. Test age slot. Test, test age? Slot. Age slot. Yeah, yeah. Which? All duration. We just added new one. So that's the one test case I could think of. Or not. Could not think more. All right, good. Let's come here. <coughs> yeah, I think uh, we also thought in the same way, like uh, the test picture name would be the calculate age test. Calculate age test. Yeah, and inside that we will write method like calculate age in hours, calculate age in days test, calculate age in month, and calculate days in year. Nothing wrong with that, but right from the beginning you know that you're going down a path where it'll lead to a combinatorial explosion of your tests, and that might not be a good strategy to go forward, right? So why write all the tests and realize, oh, you know what? I need to just throw them all away. Not a good approach. Something to think about. Let's go to that group. So our class yes, name, name will be yeah. okay. So the cl uh, function name will be check if duration correct, and it will take the parameter as the. No, no. Uh, what is the class name? The test class name. The class name will be uh, age test age, age test calculator age test age calculator test age calculator test. All right. Yeah, and the function name will be check if duration correct. It check will take duration correct. Yeah. Okay. So it will take the uh, date of that patient uh, plus okay. the reference that we are pointing to. Uh, that that you uh, said about the Ramzan day and uh, if we want to uh, give a date with which we want to find the uh, age, if we give a reference basically. Reference as in what I think. Uh, current year. Current. So you said now that uh, if we want to find the age of a person, not from current date but from some other date. When we no, are no, launching no. a I said a, that an event. Uh, you might want to uh, register duration. new duration. So right now we have four durations: years, months, days, hours. Uh, you said it when you were just telling about this thing. That you would add a new duration, that is weeks. Okay. Yeah, for that we have uh, made a generic function, but for finding the reference of the date, if we want to find the date of a person from now or from uh, ten days next. If you are having an event. No, no, no not the next, I remember. Okay. But that's okay. So you're saying that you basically have one method in your yes. test which will do all the different tests? Yes, plus it will see that if the age is coming as less than one hour, then it will throw an exception or give some kind of message. Throw an exception? Uh, not throwing an exception, but actually. Uh, it can be in minutes also. Uh, but it is not specified in the requirements, right? <laughs> not specified in the requirements. If I had all the requirements, I would have written a program that would generate the code for me. We need people to think what would happen. But that's good. You're saying there's a boundary condition what should happen over there. Yeah. Should not throw an exception for sure. Yeah, definitely. Right? But it should do something mm -hmm. else. But that's good. Let's come here. The test name is age formatter test. Age? Age formatter test. Age formatter test. And uh, uh, the, du the duration is one hour, one year. Display age in years. That is one test. For each duration time, we have one test. What's the name of the test? Uh, for duration greater than one year, display age in years. Okay. What if I add a decade? Then be a, you are adding a new thing, so you will be adding a new test case. You will also change the name of this test? 
if, if this condition is going to be exist, like this test case will be there. Now what I am saying is if you look at the name of your test, okay. the name of the test says if age greater than one year then report age in years, Yeah. right? Now what if I added decade as a duration, would this test still be valid? If this condition is going to be still there, even if you add valid, you know. No, if it is 11 years, okay. it will become one decade, not one, 11 years. Are you understanding the point I'm trying I, to I, make? I got, I got you it. guys got it. All right. So you can discuss amongst yourself. Let's move there. In this test, uh, as you say that we can have one more type of duration. So I think test requires some pluggability, and pluggability is duration strategy. And there is a chain of strategies. For example, one is uh, your, then the. Don't tell me the design. Tell me the. <laughs> So the test, so the it's very tempting to jump into the design, right? It's, it's very tempting to jump into the design and most often you make uh, kind of miscalculation without actually, uh, when you jump ahead and start designing things in the head. Nothing wrong with that, but for this purpose of this exercise, I want us to stick only to tests. Okay. So what would be the name of your test class? Calculate age. Calculate age. And what is the first test name, method? This is the first method, calculate age. And name the of the class? Name, I think if you go with the outside in approach, then it's a medical system test. Medical system test. <laughs> that means the whole hospital <laughs> one test. <laughs> All right. Uh, the reason I'm kind of hitting on these points, right, it's very important because this is what will drive your testing strategy of how you're going to actually come up with your thing. So let me kind of quickly jump and show how I would write the tests. I'm not giving any detailed feedback at this point to individuals, but you know we can do that after this session. I, I'm, I'm listening to what you guys are doing and then I'm kind of showing you quickly what I will be doing. So that gives us a reference point. So let's uh, open this. If I started from an outside in approach, right, then I would start with the patient test and I would say patient tests report age in years, report age in months, report age in days, right, report age in hours. This is where I am specifically saying that I want the age to be reported and so and so thing, right. Now this will go wrong what I was pointing out earlier that this will go wrong when I add something which is a decade. Right? So quickly you realize that this strategy of test is not a good strategy. Right? So you back off because this is leading to a combinatorial explosion. So this outside in approach might not be the best approach to start for this. So you are going to delete this and come back and do something called as the duration test. So duration test says calculate duration since and you are going to say, you know, essentially you are focusing on just the duration. So here we are saying you know, duration since whatever the value you get and you assert that that should be the value expected in terms of your result. Now, where have we defined what are the different things? So, here we are saying if this is the date of birth, this should be the years or whatever, this should be what it reports. If this is what the age is, date of birth is, then this should be the age. So, we have defined all these different combinations and essentially one test drives the whole thing saying calculate duration since, right? This is the basic test that covers the four condition. But then we also have another test which covers the modification part of it. So here we have another test which says cannot register already existing duration types. Reports error while registering non-existing duration, unregistering non-existing things. Can register and unregister largest duration. So I am saying if I said duration since would have given me 31 years, then I say alright, let's re register a new duration which is decades and then when I say since, it should say 3 decades. And once I unregister, it should give me back 31 years. 
Yes. Uh, the second case that you have, duration not unregistered invalid. Uh, that, like you have a case where you say reports error while unregistering non-existing duration times. Uh, do you think uh, your program would allow that? Do you think your program would allow that? Do your program should allow that? There is because this system particularly is a messaging based system. You could get a message which is outdated, okay. where a duration was unregistered by somebody and another message came to unregister the same duration. So you need to notify that that's already unregistered. Uh, so okay. that, okay. that's the reason that test you cons You're considering multiple users using the multiple system? Multiple users in a hospital using this right. system, right? Makes and sense. There, there is a possibility that somebody could do this. Makes sense. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, your class that you have made again over here, still it shows that it's going to add manually register or unregister, but into an object. So how different is it becoming, like, you know, from the first scenario, which you said it might not be good approach, I see the things being the same. I didn't get your question, sorry. In the second uh, second scenario that you have shown right now, you are registering and you are not registering. This is not dynamic in nature. Anyway, you have written a code for it which you are going to execute. That's a test, right? But yeah. think about a UI where someone will go and say, okay, I want to register a new duration. And they will select a new duration is decade. Mm -hmm. And they will say a decade is from a drop down. These are all my existing duration. Oh, year. It's 10 times the year. Right? Okay. So they register that. That's what will trigger this particular line of code from the UI. Okay. And then they're going to say, okay, now report the duration of this person and it should give you three decades. Okay. Then we're going to be changing code, right? You're going to have an interface through which they're going to drive this particular thing. Okay. Good question. Fantastic. If I had a prize, I would have given you a prize. Right? That's a brilliant question. So his question is, if I run this test tomorrow, right, this test might fail uh, because the, the time from now it would change, right? This test might not, but let's say the days one. This 10 days, right? <laughs> so, Hang on to that, right? This test is going to work today. If I run this test tomorrow, it's going to be 11 days, right? And this test will fail. So this is where you have a dependency on underlying system and that underlying thing keeps changing. So your test is bound to fail if you leave it like this. So what I did is I said, this test extends fixed time test case where I am going to do here I have when I extend that I have to override a method which says what is the current time. So I have to fix the time and all my tests are running against the fixed time. Right? Does it depend on the time zone? Does it depend on leap years? No, we have not gone into that, but in the real system we had to take care of all of that. Daylight savings, all of those things we had to take care of in the real complicated one. So this problem seemed like ah that's like a two days worth of work ended up being a month more, maybe more than that. All right, does this make sense? I showed you in this approach, if you do the outside in, you, you soon hit a roadblock. So inside out might be a better approach for something like this. People are here to throw me out. The last problem that I had was a meeting assistant. All right. So what is a meeting assistant going to do? So one of the common problems is I work in a distributed teams. I have six people on my team and I want to figure out when I can meet all of them, right, for 30 minutes. So I need some kind of a meeting assistant who can look at everyone's calendar and figure out who's available and what is the earliest 30 minute slot that everyone's free, right? So I want to specify the duration and I want to specify who all I want to meet and I also want to possibly specify a time out. There's no point meeting for this after three days, right? So those are three things and I want to build a meeting assistant. So what would be your first test? Group, work in your groups, don't tell me. screen that's just an example of a calendar
then I am saying Jack busy for next 2 hours. So, Jack is available in 2 hours forever. First available slot for 30 minutes is in 2 hours. Jack is available later for a required duration. So, we are saying Jack is available now for this much time. Jack is available 2 hours later. It should give you whatever for 30 minutes because you are only available for 20 minutes. So, then it should give you 2 hours later. And then you can bring in now another character Jack and Jill and you can say both of these have their calendars that you have set up and then you are saying between these two the first available slot is for 30 minutes is now, right. So, that is a uh, style of writing again outside in way of writing tests for this. Okay. They can be many characters. Why did I only choose two? Because if it's two or more, it doesn't make any difference. As a programmer, I know it two is sufficient. I don't need multiple. Maybe I would write one test for multiple, just just to test. But for majority of my development, I can just deal with. In fact, I started with only one. For a large chunk of my initial development, I only did with one. Then I brought in the concept of another user and at that point I said, you know, knowing my implementation, I do not need many users. Maybe if I was not confident, I would have added um, 4 or 5 users and tested this out, alright. So, that is pretty much it. It is 3 o'clock and I think it is time to wrap up. Thank you guys. If you have questions, I am going to be around and we can take more questions, alright.